as usual, wanting to, to impress on you that the APEX Scotland annual report was launched today, uh, and it's online, and you've got some introductory pages in your welcome pack as a taster. But please, if you can, and you're interested in the work of APEX and community justice in the community, please take the time to go on to the, our website and look at the annual report. It, among other things, uh, the extracts focus on the celebrating of the sidings in Newton Grange. Um, that's quite an exciting project and social enterprise that Apex is involved in, so I strongly recommend you look at that. I want to now uh, introduce the speaker and uh, welcome you again on behalf of Apex. We hope you'll appreciate the new venue and you'll be able to join, join us after the lecture for a drinks reception. This is our first move in, in many years from our traditional home of the Signet Library, where we were very well looked after for so many years. However, we had to take on board some comments from those who attended about access and the need for easier access, and that was crucial in our decision to come across the road to this equally beautiful setting. And I'd like to thank the staff of Edinburgh Council uh, for their help in ensuring a smooth transition with the APEC staff who organise this event. So as usual, following the lecture itself, Lady Dorian is happy to take some questions before we adjourn for refreshments. APEC's objective in putting on, on what has become, I hope you'd agree, one of the highlights in the justice calendar, is to invite speakers who are influential thinkers in today's justice dialogue, and to offer an agenda which promotes new and innovative ideas, research or insight into issues which are most topical as we aspire to a modern and progressive justice system in Scotland. Tonight's speaker, I believe, is well known to many of you as chair of the Sentencing Commission and the first woman ever to hold the position of Lord Justice Clark. Her biography is extensive, ranging from academia to law, and she has a central position in leading on sentencing guidelines for the judiciary and setting the tone for the way in which sentencing both reflects and directs the public interface with criminal justice. For over 30 years, Apex Scotland has been a major provider of services designed to keep people out of the justice system, to mitigate the harmful effects of existing involvement and reduce likelihood of further offending. Over the past 10 years, we've seen a welcome rise in progressive thinking and a move towards more community-based approach, rather than a retributional one. It is vital this move is accompanied by the development and delivery of appropriate services. At the same time, all of us have observed a progressive reduction in service availability and funding to keep people out of the justice system. Also, increasing short-term funding models combined with an austerity-driven race to the bottom in procurement of services. This, in turn, leads to lack of confidence from those bodies, including the judiciary, who might otherwise be keen to utilise alternatives in cust to custody. And as we have seen in recent years, inevitably, this leads to an upsurge in prison numbers. In this period of time where there is significant tension between the progressive justice system, the harsh realities of available funding, populism and social media influenced ideas of what justice should be, we believe, in Apex, it is a very good time to reflect on the challenges our judiciary face in balancing these pressures, while at the same time maintaining the level of independence which is explicitly central to constitutional thinking. It is easy, of course, to lay the blame for the more negative aspects elsewhere, or to seek, them, to, seek to explain them away. But we believe that if we are to realise the dream of a modern justice system, which is both fair and reconstructive, we need to understand the perspectives of all those involved, especially the judiciary. I am therefore delighted to welcome to the lectern Lord Justice Clark, Lady Dorian. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. <clears throat> I was delighted uh, to uh, be asked to give the Apex Scotland annual lecture this year, an event which offers 
a valuable opportunity, as the Chair has just said, to reflect on some of the key issues arising within the Scottish uh, justice system and, with any luck, to provoke discussion and debate about these issues. The title of this evening's lecture is Sentencing Guidelines, Challenges and Opportunities, and as that suggests, I will be speaking principally in my capacity as Chair of the Scottish Sentencing Council. The creation of that council in 2015 marked a significant change in the Scottish legal landscape. For the first time, <clears throat> we had an independent body charged with promoting consistency in sentencing, primarily through the creation of sentencing guidelines, assisting in the development of sentencing policy, and promoting greater awareness and understanding of sentencing. And it's been created at a time when all three of the, these objectives uh, are, in my view, uh, capable of having a significant effect. I'd like to use my time this evening to explore a few distinct but related challenges currently arising around sentencing policy and practice in Scotland and the opportunities which the creation of the Sentencing Council may present. First, I'd like to look at issues relating to public awareness and understanding of sentencing and the role that the Council, through the development of guidelines and otherwise, may have to play in addressing these. Secondly, I'd like to talk about our work around the sentencing of young people, where we think there is significant potential to influence the way in which harmful behaviour is addressed. And finally, I'd say a little about alternatives to imprisonment, something just been touched on, an area of increasing focus and debate and one which is, of course, of particular relevance both to the work of APEX Scotland and to many of those in the audience this evening. Turning first to public awareness and understanding of sentencing, we know that the Sentencing Commission, which led to the setting up of the Sentencing Council, found that there was little empirical evidence to suggest a widespread inconsistency in sentencing, but that there was a public perception of inconsistency. <coughs> But that was 15 years ago. What do we currently know about uh, public attitudes? This is important because if the Council is to promote greater public knowledge in this area, we obviously need to know what people think. But information about this hitherto has tended to be fairly limited, both in scope and in depth. For that reason, the Sentencing Council commissioned Ipsos Mori to carry out a nationally representative survey with a focus both on people's overall attitudes to sentencing generally and their views on sentencing for certain specific offences. The results have just been published. You can find them on our website. And what they tell us is both encouraging and challenging for the Council and, I think, for the wider justice system. Starting on a reasonably positive note, the majority of respondents were confident that Scotland's criminal justice system is fair to all. Although it is, I think, disturbing that a sizable minority, 35%, were not, which itself brings us certain challenges. For about half of respondents, the single most important aspect of sentencing was protection of the public, with rehabilitation of the offender the most important for a quarter of them. Interestingly, and I would suggest encouragingly, a different response was found in relation to the sentencing of young people, where a majority felt that there should be a greater emphasis on rehabilitation. I'll return to this point later, but <clears throat> even in the context of adults, the response to that uh, research may suggest a recognition that rehabilitation is an important aim as long as the public feel that public safety is not thereby compromised. Awareness and knowledge of sentencing was fairly mixed. 47% of respondents felt that they knew a lot or a moderate amount, while 53% thought they knew little or nothing at all about the process. And views on community sentencing were also divided. Around half of respondents feeling that community sentences did not help to reduce reoffending. When asked about their overall perceptions of sentencing, 
56% of respondents felt that sentencing in general was too lenient, which is consistent with previous surveys and other research. However, when we asked respondents how offenders should be sentenced in specific scenarios, which focused, in this case, on causing death by driving offences and sexual offences, the most common response was broadly in line with the sentences which were likely to have been imposed by a court for four out of five of the offences covered. This finding echoes the outcome of research carried out in other Western European jurisdictions. First, that people tend to think that sentencing is far more lenient than it actually is. And secondly, that when people are given the responsibility of mock sentencing, a hypothetical case, for example, uh, on the if you were the judge section of the Sentencing Council's website, their responses tend to be much closer to those of actual sentencing practice than they had expected, and far more complex than high-level opinion polls might suggest. This research also showed a slightly more nuanced picture, suggesting that public attitudes vary depending on the specific offence in question. For example, attitudes to offences involving indecent images of children were more severe than in respect of other offending behaviour, and public perceptions and attitudes perhaps more out of line uh, with uh, sentencing practice than in other cases. Overall, these findings offer uh, a fascinating but really important insight into how the people of Scotland view sentencing. And it's clear that public opinion cannot be as easily summarised as some might suggest. I think this will also be the case with some further research, which we hope to publish later this year, exploring public views, including those of victims and their families, around causing death by driving and sexual offences in considerably more depth in preparation for development of guidelines in these areas. But this initial piece of research does present us with a number of challenges, particularly around overall awareness and knowledge of the sentencing process. Sentencing is undoubtedly a complex and potentially confusing topic. But if we cannot explain in clear and simple terms how a vital aspect of our criminal justice system works and how effective different sentencing options are, what does that mean for public confidence in the justice system and for our collective ability to have an informed, rational debate about how Scotland should tackle offending behaviour? This mismatch shown in our research and elsewhere between the generalised opinion that sentences are too lenient and the more nuanced conclusions reached when carrying out a mock sentencing exercise shows, I think, how vitally important it is to provide the public with a much greater awareness and understanding of the whole sentencing process. The promotion of this awareness and understanding is, of course, a statutory objective of the Scottish Sentencing Council, and it's a challenge which we take extremely seriously. That's why we've been developing our website into a comprehensive sentencing resource containing clear explanations of how sentencing works, a jargon buster, a myth buster, interactive sentencing exercises where you can be the judge, explanatory videos which are also available on YouTube uh, describing the sentencing process, and a range of educational materials which we consider to be of very important, uh, great importance for use by teachers as part of the modern studies curriculum so that young people are given information about the sentencing process. These resources have been designed for use by a broad audience, as broad as possible, and we hope they'll be of assistance not only to the public, but to people working in criminal justice. For example, uh, they may assist uh, in staff training in advocacy and support work. I would encourage you all to look at our website and the materials there, which are free for all uh, to make use of. This dissemination of information does help promote knowledge and understanding. But apart from that, another part of the solution lies in the development of clear, concise and evidence-based sentencing guidelines 
involving full public and judicial consultation, and that's the subject to which I'd now like to turn. The introduction of a system of sentencing guidelines in Scotland could have a significant effect on the justice system, because after all, once approved by the High Court, courts have to have regard to any guidelines which are applicable, and if deciding not to follow the guideline, it must state its reasons. In addition to supporting and assisting judicial decision-making, we believe that the guidelines will pay, play a key role in addressing some of the issues which our research and other research has highlighted, increasing public understanding of sentencing, providing more clarity and transparency around how decisions are reached, and explaining the various factors which are taken into account. In this way, we hope that the mismatch about which I men made reference a moment ago uh, can be addressed. We think this is of critical importance, particularly uh, for those involved in the, the case, be it as witnesses or as uh, victims. It's unlikely, I suppose, that we'll ever reach a point where everyone agrees with the final sentence imposed. But it should at least be clear why that sentence was imposed. And with that in mind, the Council took an early decision to focus initially on several general guidelines applying to all offences in order to describe some of these foundational elements which underpin all sentencing decisions in Scotland. We fully recognise the interest in the development of more specific guidelines on particular offences, and that, of course, is likely to be ultimately our primary focus, and we have started work on a number of these. But at the outset, we were conscious that, unlike in many other jurisdictions, the fundamental principles and purposes of sentencing in Scotland had never been expressly defined in any single piece of legislation or any single court judgment. And so we decided that that should be the focus of our first guideline. Similarly, the sentencing process, namely the steps which judges go through to make a sentencing decision, have not been described in detail. And we considered it vital to address these matters as a first step, uh, and we expect the resulting guidelines will be of benefit not just to the judiciary, but to the public. And they will also form a principled framework for the preparation of offence-specific guidelines in due course. The first guideline on principles and purposes of sentencing was approved by the High Court, came into force last year, and has already been referred to in several court decisions. It states that the core principle of sentencing in Scotland is fairness and proportionality, and that this requires a number of supporting principles, including that sentences should be no more severe than is necessary to achieve the appropriate purposes of sentencing in each case, and that reasons for sentencing decisions must be stated as clearly and openly as circumstances permit. It also sets out the purposes which sentences may seek to achieve, which include protection of the public, punishment, rehabilitation, giving the offender the opportunity to make amends, and expressing disapproval of offending behaviour. Now, in practice, of course, most sentences will be selected with a view to achieving more than one of these purposes. And there will, in some cases, undeniably be a tension between these different purposes, where the sentencer must strive to achieve the correct balance between these potentially competing purposes as dictated by the particular circumstances of the given case. It's not difficult to imagine a case, perhaps a serious sexual offence, where the sentencer carefully has to balance the goals of public protection, disapproval of the offending behaviour, punishment and rehabilitation. The guideline does not provide a hierarchy of these purposes, so it will always be for the court to decide in individual cases whether any particular purpose or purposes apply, and which, if any, has to be given greater or lesser emphasis. This allows the sentencer to take full account of all the individual circumstances of each case. The work on the principles and purposes uh, guideline naturally flows into the question of how courts actually arrive at sentencing decisions. How do they put these principles and purposes into practice? And that became the subject of our second general guideline, the sentencing process, uh, about which we're in the 
middle of a, or near the end of a, a consultation process and which we hope to finalise and present to the High Court early next year. That guideline explains how courts reach sentencing decisions. It sets out the various steps which the court takes, assessing the seriousness of the offence, looking at the harm caused, looking at the aggravating and mitigating factors, and so on. The sentencing process as a whole is, in our experience, not always well understood. And it's our hope that this guideline will assist in explaining how the courts operate and will contribute substantially to public knowledge and understanding of the process. Uh, we also hope that by creating uh, these uh, guidelines in general terms means that we will not need to repeat the foundational elements and the steps in every offence-specific guideline, making these more concise, simpler to understand and easier to use. The way in which we develop the guidelines is also uh, critical if they are to serve the various different roles which I've suggested. We took an early decision that our work should be evidence-based, that involves extensive research and engagement. We're committed to taking the necessary time to understand current practice, to look at what works and why, and to listen to those involved in and affected by the sentencing process, including victims, and to take on board what they have to say. Significantly, and I think this approach is vindicated by the research into public perceptions, this includes carrying out a full public consultation on all of our guidelines. We want to hear from as wide and diverse an audience as possible in formulating our guidelines, because the intention is that they should be of use to everyone who has cause to consult them whether that be as a member of the judiciary, a legal practitioner, a victim of crime, or an interested member of the public. And this is not a box-ticking exercise. In finalising a guideline, we do take into account the views which we hear. For example, in our draft principles and purposes guideline, protection of the public and rehabilitation of offenders naturally both featured. But as a result of the public consultation, they were given a greater prominence and featured as distinct purposes of sentencing as opposed to being wrapped up within other purposes. And that was as a direct result of listening to the public consultation. Of course, this approach means that guidelines will not be developed overnight. But given the potential impact of guidelines which have not been properly uh, considered and tested, we do not think it would be appropriate to curtail research and consultation which are so vital. Now, I mentioned our proposed guideline on the sentencing of young people. This is a topic which we included in our first business plan and which we felt was a natural progression from our first two general guidelines. It applies to all offences where uh, the offender is a young person. It's more narrowly focused, therefore, on the group of people who, as the justice system already recognises, should be treated differently for sentencing purposes. We believe that a guideline on the sentencing of young people will bring a number of benefits. In particular, it should increase public knowledge and confidence by explaining why the process of sentencing a young person is different from that of sentencing an older person. It should increase transparency by ensuring that young people and others interested in the case understand what is happening during the process and why a particular sentence has been imposed and what it means. It should assist the judiciary and legal practitioners through identifying the particular factors that should be considered when sentencing a young person, and it should promote consistency in the sentencing of young people. So it will apply to all offences, but only where the offender is a young person. We intend to attempt to capture those particular factors which should be taken into account in such cases. So, for example, the lack of maturity, which can lead to risk-taking behaviour and impetuosity, the vulnerability to negative influences, and the fact that personality being less well-formed as in an adult, the capacity for change is generally considered to be greater. And unlike our principles and purposes guideline, which, as I said, does not pro provide a hierarchy of purposes, this guideline will specifically address the question of whether 
with a young person, particular emphasis should be given to any specific sentencing purpose. Now, the most obvious candidate for priority in this context is rehabilitation. The United Con Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child says, and as our own courts have confirmed, that the best interests of someone under 18 must always be a primary consideration when sentencing them. And as I've already mentioned, a significant proportion of the public already identify rehabilitation as the most important purpose of sentencing in relation to young people. In taking account of the best interests of the young person, regard must also be had to the desirability of the child's reintegration into society. In selecting a sentence, therefore, the three factors already mentioned, lack of maturity, susceptibility to negative influences, and capacity for change, all require to be considered. In uh, England uh, and Wales, in the case of uh, the Queen on behalf of Smith against the Secretary of State for the Home Department, Lady Hale noted that of these three, the first meant that a juvenile's irresponsible conduct was not as morally reprehensible as that of an adult. The second meant that juveniles had a greater claim to be forgiven for failing to escape the negative influences around them. And the third meant that even the most heinous crime was not necessarily evidence of an irretrievable depraved character. Now this can be particularly challenging for the court, especially in the most serious offenses where the court may find itself having to balance a number of sentencing purposes, even when giving priority where possible to, need, to the need to facilitate and encourage rehabilitation of the young person. This general approach to the sentencing of young people cannot be crudely caricatured as simply giving a young person a lighter or softer sentence than an older person. Uh, as with every single sentencing exercise, it's about selecting the most appropriate sentence in the case before the court, taking into account the circumstances of, of the offence and the particular circumstances of the offender. Fundamental to doing so, however, is recognition that the sentencing of a young person is an entirely different exercise from the sentencing of an adult. In our work, we've been giving careful consideration to the cardinal question of how a young person is to be defined for the purposes of the guideline. Although it may be difficult to establish a clear line between a young person and an adult, we consider it vital that the applicability of the guideline is as clear and transparent as possible. We decided that uh, definition by age was the only practical and realistic way of achieving this. We're considering three different potential uh, age limits, 18, 21, and 25. The existing statutory framework, of course, provides support for either 18 or 21. Uh, as we know, a sentence of detention cannot currently be imposed on anyone under 21 unless the court considers that no other sentence is appropriate. In respect of 25, we've been considering research into brain development and maturation over the last two de decades, which suggest that the brain may not be fully developed until the mid-20s. Research we've considered so far indicates that there are three stages of development. Physical maturity of the brain, which happens around age 12 or 13. Intellectual maturity, the fundamental logical operational thought processes, which evolved during adolescence and up to 18. And emotional maturity, which develops during young adulthood. This is the final and most cognitively sophisticated phase involving the development of higher executive functions, such as the ability to plan and to control emotions. And our understanding at the moment is that it advances in functional neuroimaging suggest that these do not fully develop until about the age of 25. So this issue is one of the key areas that we're interested in exploring in our public consultation on the draft guideline which we intend to launch within the next few months. We recognize that it's potentially controversial to suggest that those up to the age of 25 should be treated as young people for the sentencing purpose. And for that reason, we've commissioned a further review 
examining in detail current research on brain development uh, to inform our eventual decision on this area of age and to provide an evidence base for the public and others to consider. It's worth stressing, however, that whatever precise age limit is se selected in the drug guideline will not materially affect the general approach taken. The experience of those working directly with people who have offended is vital in ensuring that we take fully informed and evidence-based decisions. And I'd very much like to encourage you to respond to the consultation when it comes out. From all that I've said, it's clear that when sentencing a young person, however we define a young person, it's essential that courts have available to them as wide a range as possible of robust, meaningful and effective alternatives to imprisonment. But of course, it goes much wider than that. As I mentioned earlier, the Principles and Purposes guideline states that sentences should be no more severe than is necessary. If we want courts to impose prison sentences only when no other sentence is appropriate and that that is the most appropriate sentence, and we do, these alternatives have to be available to the courts no matter the age of the offender. And by available, I mean that they must be available to courts across Scotland in a joined up, consistent manner and judges need to have full and detailed information about what can be done in their area. If these factors are present, then the council can play its part in ensuring that non-custodial disposals are applied by courts in a clear, consistent and transparent way, one which enhances public confidence in community-based disposals, which, as we've seen from the research, cannot be taken for granted, and which delivers proportionate justice in respect of offenders facilitating a reduction in the likelihood of reoffending. In a speech to Sacro in 2013, the then Lord Justice Clark, Lord Carlaway, pointed out, if the stated principles are not mere rhetoric, and if the courts are to have regard to, for example, the need to reduce crime through deterrence or to the reform and rehabilitation of offenders, the courts have to know, amongst other critical matters, what demonstrably operates as a deterrent what has been shown to rehabilitate effectively and what values should be put on each element in a given case. Now, anecdotally, and it was touched on in the introduction by your chairman, the council is aware that levels of availability and information aren't always all that they might be. Given the increasing focus in this area, we plan to engage with the judiciary at a local level to explore what issues may be arising though clearly the adequate provision of alternatives to custody falls out with our remit. Uh, I note in that uh, connection that the government's National Commun Community Justice Leadership Group met for the first time in August. And for my part, I support its aims of further strengthening community justice services and alternatives to custody and increasing public and judicial confidence in community justice by demonstrating its effectiveness in supporting rehabilitation and reducing reoffending but it's important that those aims are achieved and not merely aims. I should make two things clear. First, this does not necessarily mean that provision across the country should be entirely uniform or that sentences imposed in different parts of the country must be exactly the same for similar offences. There will always be a place for innovation and local innovation at that. And the council is watching with interest initiatives such as the various problem-solving courts which have grown up around Scotland. We will generally support any move to make effective sentencing options more widely available and to roll out examples of best practice around the country. And secondly, I'm not making a political point here. There will always be a place in our system for the appropriate use of custody, and I would not expect any judge in Scotland to shy away from that. At the same time, though, there needs to be recognition that inappropriate use of custody carries with it a significant cost. And I don't just mean the cost to the state in monetary terms of keeping someone locked up, although that is considerable. I mean also the cost to the individual, to families, and to the community of depriving someone of their liberty when there is an appropriate alternative available. Someone who is in prison is unlikely to be able to keep a job. On release, they may be less likely to find employment. Their links to their family and their community will be disruptive. 
the housing may disappear. The impact on the family can be significant. Short sentences do not always facilitate the use of rehabilitative programs. We know that all of this has an impact on the likelihood of re-offending. I've mentioned a number of topics this evening, ladies and gentlemen, but in my view, there is a common theme running through all of them, and that is the importance of knowledge and understanding, both in terms of what the public know about sentencing and what we within the criminal justice system know about public views and perceptions. It's clear from our research to date that the Council still has a job to do in relation to promoting greater public awareness and understanding of sentencing. Our research and engagement provide us with empirical evidence of public attitudes to and knowledge of sentencing, both in general and in relation to specific offences. This helps keep us focused. It reminds us of the work that we need to do to help us meet our statutory objective in this area and gives us some insight into where we should be concentrating our efforts. By further developing our knowledge of what sentencing options are and are not available, in addition to what public attitudes are to sen sentencing, we are better able to contribute meaningfully and in an informed way to the development of sentencing policy, including, where appropri appropriate, doing what we can to encourage the provision of a range of meaningful and effective sentencing options, allowing the courts to select the most appropriate sentence rather than be unduly restricted because of a lack of those options. Without sufficient knowledge and understanding, public debate and discussion around sentencing is at risk of becoming a simplistic and uninformed argument between prison and soft touch justice, between tough on crime and letting offenders walk free. The reality of sentencing, as everyone in this room knows, is far more complex, far more nuanced. And I think the challenge for the council and for all of us is to create the conditions under which we can have a more informed, more constructive discussion about how best to deal with offending behaviour in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, Lady Dorian, thank you for such an explicit and clear presentation. I think I was intrigued or, or delighted, as many others will have been, at the efforts the Council has made to engage with the broader community in a subject as important as this, and both the range of, of ways that you're doing that. We now come to that part of the event where we have questions. Uh, there's no to talk about a panel. Well, I'm not going to be on that panel. I think we've got Lady Dorian here. That's excellent. Alan might want to, to chip in. My colleagues from Stranraer, uh, Silvana and Callum, have microphones. So if you can follow the usual process as you're thinking through your question, can you first of all raise your hand to indicate you want to ask a question? Can you please tell us who you are and where you're from? And then the, the question, I'll ask Lady Dorian, or if appropriate, Alan, to respond. So who would like to ask the first question? At a time like this, I wish I had prepared a question myself. Thank you. Richard. Richard Thompson, Manager of Community Justice Partnership. In the recent National Citizens Council with uh, Molly, who was published, there was no mention of uh, complex trauma and public attitudes to the um, we consider sentencing in the case of complex trauma. Um, given the wider evidence and other evidence based around that, I uh, just wonder whether that's something that's going to be taken forward in future research. Issues, uh, particularly in relation to young people, um, and we will be looking at that further. Um, initially, at least in our um, uh, work on the guideline for uh, sentencing of young people, um, we are we have been following that debate, and we are taking it into account. 
It will be reflected in due course in consultation. Come with the next question, please. Come. Hello, Eamon, City of Edinburgh Council, so welcome to the City Chambers. <laughs> Thank you. You started by mentioning uh, populism in our politics and media, and uh, I tend to think some of the views of the public where they think sentences aren't harsh enough tend to come from some cases publicised in the media, and usually uh, taking on the view of a reporter, getting the view of, of a victim's family, or a politician, or a, a, a journalistic commentator who's willing to say that the sentence wasn't harsh enough. Uh, given uh, your thoughtful way of looking at all of this, how do you intend to publicise it in a way that would get across to the public that the guidelines are there to help everyone and actually maybe do away with some of these misconceptions? Um, one of the things that was interesting about the research uh, that we had uh, Ipsos Mori conduct for us was that although there was uh, this number of people who felt at a generalised level that sentencing was too lenient, um, we found that um, when we looked at the individual scenarios that did not support a suggestion that um, the public took a strongly punitive approach or an unduly punitive uh, approach uh, and our, the research suggests that public attitudes are actually a lot more nuanced and complex than sometimes they're given credit for. Um, we have taken the view that we should engage as widely as possible with the public and to consult, as I have said, widely on all our guidelines. But we have also taken the view that we should be as open as we possibly can be with the press and the media. Uh, and um, myself and other members of the council have uh, repeatedly given interviews to members of the press seeking to advance the knowledge and understanding uh, of the sentencing process for the press and the media as well as for the public. Um, we really sometimes it seems hardly a week goes by without being asked to do that and by and large we do agree to give those um, interviews uh, either by phone or on television or for newspapers uh, and we see that as an important part of laying that um, foundational basis for the knowledge and understanding of the public. We need to make sure that that knowledge and understanding is in the hands of the press as well. Thanks very much, Liam McCarthy, I'm a member of the Justice Committee. And following on from uh, Ian's question here, from the work you've done through this memorial more broadly, what level of um, recognition is there within the, 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 the public about the linkage between um, better rates of rehabilitation and broader public safety? Sorry, between? Between the, the, the issue of improving levels of rehabilitation and, and, the, and thereby improving uh, public safety in general. I realise it's, it's, a, it's a difficult task, but you were suggesting there's a more nuanced understanding perhaps that comes through the both of the figures from it just well, I think the more nuanced understanding comes when, when we see members of the public actually looking at a given scenario and trying to say, well, what they think should be the appropriate sentence um, for that um, given offence. In those circumstances, we found that they were much more nuanced and much more in line with general sentencing practice. Um, I, I think it's telling that the two issues which were the most important ones for 75% of the respondents were rehabilitation and protection of the public and that in general terms the uh, feeling was that uh, protection of the public was most important with rehabilitation coming in second whereas that was reversed with young people. That I think does suggest that the public have a more nuanced uh, understanding of the issues which are involved here than uh, they may sometimes be given 
uh, credit for. Um, we haven't, I think it's fair to say, explored that in real depth so far in our um, research, but that certainly is uh, the picture that comes across to me from the uh, research so far. And it, it's interesting also that I mentioned uh, that in our purposes, principles and purposes guideline, we responded to public, um, the public consultation by giving specific, a specific focus to two issues that the public had raised uh, their concerns about. And these were those very same issues, namely protection of the public and um, rehabilitation. And I get the impression that the public do accept that rehabilitation is a very important aim of sentencing as long as they can be satisfied that protection of the public is thereby ensured. I want to thank probably for two more questions, because I'll, I'll just say that because there's usually a rush at the end, but I'll come again in this. Hi, Patrick Hyde from Tommy Park School. I wondered if there was any focus on in gender, if, if the public had different attitudes when it was for an offending, conscious of the level of um, we, we haven't conducted or, or asked anyone to conduct research on that issue for us uh, at the, the moment. We are aware um, from discussions that we've had with people in the course of developing our work on um, uh, a guideline for sentencing young people that there is an argument that some of the issues which apply in relation to young men who offend may be different from those of young women. But we're also aware that that applies more generally across the board. We would, I think, find it difficult at this stage to see how we could incorporate a gender issue in our young person's guideline. But we are interested to hear further about these issues from, from people who uh, have got experience of these. Uh, and we will be looking at that again in future. We, we have not uh, reached any concluded view that we shouldn't have any further general guidelines, whether in relation to gender or whether in relation to um, mental health issues or whatever else. We're, 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 open to, we're open to hear what people think. So then, I was on the original sentencing commission and it's great to see how things have moved on. Um, I'm just struck, I suppose, listening to, to what you're saying about, um, I suppose what's going through my head is the link between um, rehabilitation and protecting the public because the more we do about rehabilitation, then surely we are protecting the public. And I suppose that's where you know, we start with justice and where the need to be options come in. But I suppose my, my question's really around um, to what extent sentencers, judges can move, move on, if that's the right word, from applying the law to really then engaging in the criminal justice process. And you mentioned individualized sentencing, and it's always going to be that balance between dealing with the behavior that's presented and I suppose, calculating the right tariff, if I can put it crudely, to looking at what that person really needs and I suppose the unintended consequences, particularly when well, a social sentence on families and all of that. So, I, I suppose I'm just curious about what this all means for sentences um, and, and to what extent we, there was a balance between that role of, of looking at individualised sentencing, um, not necessarily creating you know, problem solving courts, but just seeing that person as a whole person. I think it's easier with young people, but it's always been that balance between the sentencer's role as the adjudicator, as it were, and, and looking at the needs that, that are well, it's always been the case that the sentencer has to look at all the circumstances of the case. And looking at all the circumstances of the case involves looking at the particular and individual and individual circumstances of the offender. Um, we have in the uh, principles and purposes guideline that specifically 
uh, identifies the individual circumstances as factors which require to be taken into account and it also provides that sentences should be mo no more severe than is necessary to meet the objective of sentencing or the purpose of sentencing. So uh, I think that the, the framework which these general guidelines are, are setting, which actually reflects largely the, the approach taken by judges at the moment, um, is, is one which will achieve what you are um, really discussing. I could be persuaded to take one more question, but, but uh, or I might have to take two or even three. This is not uh, two without central. Hi there again, I'm Christian Colley from the Criminal Justice Office of the Forum. Um, I'm very interested to hear what your thoughts are on the balance guidelines that are sort of descriptive versus those that are prescriptive. Um, we discussed in relation to the um, current sentencing process consultation, and it's largely a reflection of current practice. Um, but how do you balance that with taking an evidence-based approach which would perhaps in the future uh, set out that process or a set of guidelines that are not current practice and um, given what we know about judicial opinions on sort of outside political interference and sentencing ownership process and wealth expertise, how do you propose to balance any tensions that, that might cause? Well, in relation to things like the <clears throat> principles and purposes uh, and the process guideline, these are really addressing issues which are, are pretty well established and understood, not just in this jurisdiction, but in other jurisdiction. And we, in reality, we don't really expect that these will have a major impact on sentencing practice on the judiciary, for example, although it will give them a, a framework to work with, uh, they are more designed to be the, the high level framework for the development of further guidelines and also to provide the information to the public to promote awareness and understanding. But from going forward, we, we do recognise that we will be looking at other issues in relation to the sentencing and will not just be reflecting um, necessarily what practice is. And I think what I was saying about the draft, proposed draft guideline in relation to young people um, is an example of that. Because one of the things we've been looking at here is to look at the research that has been developing in relation to um, the way in which the adolescent brain matures and the consequences that that may have for sentencing which is actually quite different from what the current sentencing practice is and that is something which you know we will be consulting on uh, fully so uh, I don't think we feel ourselves in any way inhibited by current practice. Can two questions back? Lady Dorian, I wonder if you could tell us, are there any plans to have another look at uh, descriptive sentences? Because um, certainly, um, as a justice in peace, I sometimes find it a bit more. Um, I'm sure the public would be a bit of a strange if you hear from the descriptive extent of many sentences where someone receives that automatic one third of their sentence of pleading guilty at the first opportunity when the man had been possibly caught red handed and was up to great difficulty in doing anything other than pleading guilty at the first opportunity. Or in fact, uh, a lawyer says, now that my client has had the opportunity to look at the CCTV evidence, now he remembers that they committed the offence. Thank you. Well, of course, the, the um, requirement to um, consider discounting is a statutory requirement created by Parliament. Uh, and there are, at the moment, a number of cases setting out the circumstances in which a discount should be given, how it should be addressed, how it should be assessed, and so on. Uh, what uh, we have announced in our most recent business plan, though, is that we are to begin work on developing a guideline on sentence discounting, which will look at all those authorities, look at the appropriate approach to be taken, in cases where a sentence discount arises. Thank you. I think we've got one other question at the back. Come on. 
Hi, Katie Knox from Families Outside. You mentioned the UNCRC when sentencing the young person in prison, but I just wondered if there was any consideration given to children's rights when a parent was sent to prison. You raise a, an interesting issue there because I, I think one of the things I mentioned at the end of um, my speech was the impact that a sentence of imprisonment imposed on someone has on families. Uh, and that is something that I think has increasingly become an issue uh, for people to consider. It's an area that we haven't yet developed um, very strongly in the course of our work, but it is something that we will be looking at. Thank you. Well, I think that's all of my thoughts. There's another question. Yes, one more question here, please. Um, yeah, I'm the community just to Scotland. Um, I very much welcome the work of the Council um, given justice is riven with myth and misunderstanding. So I think that the steps that the Council's taken um, are sensible, logical and necessary. One of the issues that um, would be of particular interest to community justice Scotland, I think others as well, given that the community's disposals and the access is through the people who pass the sentences. Um, it would be a real interest if we find a mechanism that would help us understand not just what vexes sheriffs in terms of community-based disposals, community back orders, but also the reverse of that, but hope it increases the confidence um, from a sheriff's perspective. Well, as I, as I mentioned, in the course of my, my talk, the issue of uh, confidence in community sentences is not just one for uh, sentencers, um, but it's one for the public as well. And the issue that, one of the issues that arose from the research that we got was that there was pretty weak confidence from the, the public in the effectiveness of community-based disposals. Um, partly that's to do with a lack of awareness and knowledge and understanding of what is out there and what they're designed to achieve. Um, I think partly um, that will be assisted by increasing the knowledge and understanding of the, the public about that. Um, there are, of course, certain initiatives up and down the court the country in relation to problem solving courts which are designed to achieve the very thing that you're talking about uh, and this element of, of uh, confidence in community justice is something we're very keen to pursue and to hear from people about so um, we would welcome any input that you have to give us as you know we have worked with community justice scotland uh, hitherto that's the end of our question and answer session, so I'm going to invite our Chief Executive, Alan Staff, to close the event. Thank you, Brian. This is my ninth Apex lecture, and I'm, I'm incredibly proud of the reputation that we've built up over the years by bringing speakers to the platform who've not only achieved outstanding success in their own field, but who can offer a perspective on justice uh, in Scotland, which helps us to forward the progressive agenda which this country deserves. Um, I take no credit uh, for the, uh, the excellent timing of this uh, event this evening, coming just a day after the, um, the release of the survey that uh, Lady Dorian uh, referred to. So, uh, but you know, we, we seem to get it right more often than we get it wrong. Tonight, I believe, has continued that tradition. Um, I feel that we have heard a perspective which m some of us may not naturally do. We, 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 may not, we may not naturally gravitate to sort of try to understand um, how sentencing affects people, what, what sort of principles are, are there, and what the, the process that those who are entrusted with this responsibility have to go through in order to fit into 
this, this notion of, of, of uh, a progressive justice um, matched up against public opinion. I take away from this evening a number of things. We know that it's vital to address public understanding and perception. We've all heard the sort of various talks about the, the use of the offender, um, the way that the offender is demonised to create a public enemy that we can then put all of our uh, righteous indignation upon whenever, it, uh, whenever we choose. And we share some responsibility, I believe, uh, corporately um, for that and for the, the images and pictures that the public have of the justice system, largely because we're not consistent in actually saying how good it is. We're very, very good at saying how bad it is. We're great at uh, moaning and creating when there is a problem, um, but we are really not very good at saying what an outstanding job a lot, awful lot of people are doing out there. Um, so maybe we take some responsibility for that. The guidelines for sentencing young people, fascinating. Um, if we start talking about under 25s, for our client group, they're dropping off. We're not seeing people much over the age of 25. People are stopping offending. I wonder what we read into that. The, sort of, the, the, the concept that, that maybe you know, there is this uh, maturation process, and once that happens, offending stops. That's a, that's, that, that starts taking us down a very interesting place, um, and maybe we need to think a lot more about that. We've talked about uh, or heard about the, the need for a wide range of options. Um, absolutely. Availability across the whole of Scotland. Um, justice cannot be dependent on where you happen to live. We can't have that. That is, that is not uh, something that we would say would be uh, anything like the notion of a just society. And finally, I think we have some thoughts about the interaction between sentencing and society and about how we, we address those things. We cannot fiddle around around the edges. We cannot make changes in uh, sentencing without making changes to what is available to allow that sentencing, the flexibility and the rationality that we, we know that it deserves. If we want a progressive system, we have to have a strategic approach to justice. We have to have a vision for justice, and we have to take that forward. So I want to thank you, Zorin, for uh, an excellent uh, lecture this evening. Thank you for uh, offering some uh, new information for us which I, I found very, uh, very interesting, uh, and for challenging us uh, on a number of issues. It's a mantra of Apex uh, Scotland that the measure of a great justice system is not how many, me how many people we put through it, it's how many people we keep out of it. And I hope that, that we can go away from here thinking that, that you know, what we need to do, public pr pr protection, yes, but public protection comes in a lot of different ways. And that's something that we've talked about. My final um, role here tonight, and it's a pleasurable one, is to thank everyone who's been involved in, in doing this. Um, thank particularly Lynn and, and, and Karen for, for uh, their work in, in putting all of the arrangements together. Um, thank you to Edinburgh City Council and for, for this, this room. I hope you'll, you'll uh, agree that it's a, a really good venue. Uh, I'm pleased with the sort of intimacy of it as well as the, uh, the gorgeous surroundings. Um, and for, for the staff and team that have, that have made us welcome. You're invited, you're very, very welcome to come and uh, have a drinks reception. Um, you'll need to come out of that door and go down to the end of the corridor into the, the European room. It's very uh, apt. <laughs> I'm not saying it. <laughs> I just, just put it out there, you know. Um, 
And just to remind you that uh, the video of this evening and, and a transcript will be on our website. And also, I believe it's going on the Sentencing Council's website. So you'll be able to pick it up on, on both places. So thank you for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. See you through. If not, have a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.